Um, books, a lot of different books. This book, I actually have, I bought this book myself, I have it at home. We have seven or eight books downstairs in our library, most of which are rarely used, but they are, they're some good books. This one is a great book on how to set up a bandsaw. It applies to almost any bandsaw you ever see. They're, they're all the, the same in terms of the wheels, the adjustments, and, and so on and so forth. So there's lots of them down there that are really quite useful. Now that one I have found easy to read and, and helpful. Uh, a little bit about adjustments. If I was using a bandsaw for the first time, this bandsaw, or one that smells like shop, or the one downstairs, I would make sure it's unplugged. I'd walk up to it, I'd open the, the door. Most have two doors, an upper door for the upper wheel, lower door for the lower wheel, with a little knob or a catch on the side. Most open the other way, the hinge will open that way, but it doesn't matter, it's a door. I'd walk up to it when it's unplugged and do this. And you can see that it's going to spin, it's going to turn freely without any crazy noises happening, and the blade is staying on that top wheel as it should. If something's not turning, not turning, or not staying centered properly, then you know it's not set up properly. Each one of these wheels has, has on it a rubber sort of track the blade rides on, and if they're <coughs> to hold the blade and hold the tension that's on the blade, it should stay true no matter how many times you go around like this. Now, you would think, of course, this top wheel, Rob, sorry. Where should the optimum be on the blade to the rubber? Should it be in the middle? Should it be towards the front? Should it be towards the back? Good question. In my experience, and I'm not even my red textbook, but in my experience, you want the entire blade on the rubber. If it's over the front edge of the rubber, you're going to be on the aluminum or cast iron. In this place, it's a composite material of the wheel itself, which isn't going to be good for the teeth of your blade or for the wheels. On the rubber, and what I think you want, middle rubber if you can get it there, but somewhere where it's going to track true and stay tracking true the whole time. That's, that's what I think is important. Um, so I would do this with it, make sure it's going to run smoothly, and then I would look at the adjustments in terms of the tension on the blade. Tension on most saws, ours downstairs, is on top either a lever or one of our saws, or a knob that you turn to increase tension. This saw is a little different. It's got this red lever in here with a tightening knob in the back, which you loosen, and then you pull it up or down to increase or decrease the tension on this blade. What it's doing is moving this wheel further or closer to this pivot point, Increasing the tension on the whole thing. With ours downstairs and most other bigger sizes, you'll see you have a loosening mechanism and you crank down, which pushes the wheel up and increases your tension. The big question is how much tension do you need? I've read about three ways to do this. I've used two of them. The fancy way, buy a tensionometer, a device that measures the tension of the blade. Anybody got one? I don't have one. No. The second way, it's really technical. Be careful with this one. If you look at the blade, once you get it running true and straight on there, not plugged in, you just turn it around by, by hand like I've done, and you say, okay, it should be about, yeah, about that tight. You can push it with an easy finger, maybe a half inch deflection. But how much, is, how much force do you use, as much as half inch? You can do it that way. The third way, which I have done, and it's called, it, it's, it works, it's called the flutter test. You plug the saw in. Uh, the, piece closed over, you tuck the saw in, and you run the blade on, the, on a very low tension, which you suspect is way too low. If it's on low tension, the blade's going to go back and forth, visibly and noisily fluttering back and forth. You then increase the tension slowly until the flutter stops, the noise stops, and the wave rate of it stops, and that should be enough tension, they say. I actually add a little quarter turns. I'm just, I like things a bit tighter for some reason. A little bit extra tension on there, and that should be all you need. The tension on blades won't stay the same. One thing downstairs, you put a new blade on the saw tonight, someone sets it up just right, three days from now, it probably is going to be loose. It stretches a little bit. Question. So people don't understand you, when you're trying that flutter, if you don't hang on to the blade. No, no, you don't touch it, you're right. You turn it on, you stand back, it'll be fluttering all by itself. And then you just adjust the tension on top, make it a bit tighter, until that fluttering visible, visibly and noise just stops. And then you can probably safely use it. So on, on my neck, I'm kind of general, and on the back it has a gauge, and, and I've never really truly understood, I'll be very honest, yep. I go by the feel, yep. and I'm just wondering, because mine is, is, is turned at the top, mm -hmm. and then the gauge, you push down, the gauge enables, and you can see where you are, but I still don't know. Yeah, there's a heavy spring in there, yeah. that I think you're compressing, and you know about springs, they're supposed to kind of keep the same spring constant forever, but they don't. They get old, they get brittle, they can even break. So I don't trust that, that mechanism in the back as far as the reading goes. Uh, the numbers in the back are supposed to be, my understanding is, you've got a three-quarter inch blade, a one-eighth inch blade, 
A one inch eighth inch blade shouldn't take as much tension as a half or three quarters of a blade. Should match the blade width, is what you're suggesting. Ideally, when it's factory fresh, maybe so. I I, I don't I don't want to look at that at all. I just go by A is it fluttering? B is it tension feel like it's right on there? And then I go with that. Yes. So with regards to tension, um, I'm just asking this because I personally don't do it, but um, do you back the tension off when you're not using the machine? Probably you should. I don't do it either. Do your fans have to come with a switch? Well, oh, they do. One of our downstairs has got a got a lever on top that can lock a cam lever. You can just simply lower it down and tension's off. You know, which is one reason to wash. If you walk in and turn the saw on, tension's off. It's going to flutter all over the place. Yeah, and I saw a little tip that when you when you leave your saw in the night, you turn your cam lock off and you take your key from your out of your van off, your mm -hmm. lock key, and put up hang it over that yeah. lever, so you can't turn it on. The yeah. lock key and hang it. Yeah. So this little yellow piece I just pulled out of the on-off switch here. A lot of tools now do have a little safety on-off key. Look at that be in there and you can't turn the saw on or off. If you have kids around, probably a pretty wise thing to do. Take that in. My shop is heated, but if my shop was not heated, I would back the tension on the front just because <coughs> Yeah, you're right. Probably for longevity of the, the blades and the bearings, it's probably a good idea to take tension off if you can do that. Yeah. Okay, the uh, tension we're pretty much covered, I think. Um, one other thing about the blade, the, uh, the wheel at the top here. All blade, all the saws are set up so that the, the main wheel at the bottom, you can't adjust where the motor is from. This, this saw, the second wheel here, I believe you also can't adjust, that's where the motor is. But one of them you can, the top one, and almost every saw there is. The top wheel can be go up or down for tension, and it can also tilt in and out for tracking. So I make a mistake once of getting a nice level, putting it across the, this wheel, hoping I get it totally vertical. And after I fiddle with like for 20 minutes, half an hour, the blade wasn't tracking worth, worth, like, worth a darn. I finally realized, well, what if my whole saw isn't, isn't plumb? Being level and plumb is not important, but being in the same direct plane as the lower wheel, in the same exact line, that's important. So you can't level this one other than, there's a, this one's an Allen key on the back that causes this wheel to tilt out or tilt in. When you first try this by hand with the blade going around, if it's not staying in the same spot, you have to adjust that tilt. Okay. They're all different. I have a built of three wheels. Actually, there's four because the motor is connected up to a fourth one that drives the pulley. And uh, the one that adjusts out and in is, and angle the tension is the one on the side. Over here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've never seen the three wheels until today. The three wheels have been inside. But there are three and four it's wheels. A big one. Yeah. Yeah. So everyone's a lot, you need to know is there is a tension mechanism, there is a wheel adjustment tilt mechanism somewhere on one of those, so you need to find where it is for, for your saw, for sure. I was going to say, for our saws downstairs, if you haven't used them before, you're uncomfortable, I know that whether it's Chad or Mike or Tom or lots of people in the club will be happy to, someone here will know how to, how to adjust it for you and show you how this, these saws work that way. Alright, um, the table. Little thing, but if this nut in the back is not tight, you start sawing, this table can wobble around. That's not a good thing for your quality, your cut, or for your safety. So you want it to be on there tight. Almost all saws, I'll say, or probably all of them, have a little mechanism. This one's right here, there's a little set screw going through. You probably can't see it, it's very small. But it goes down through the table. So when I tilt this table back down, it'll only go to that point, and it's hitting the body of the saw, and that should be. 90 degree lock. The ones downstairs, what, what's this saw doing when it's on? It vibrates. You know, after lots of use, things get a little bit loose, things move, and it's not going to be at 90 degrees all the time unless you check it's 90 degrees. So you've got to be aware of that. That's an adjustment you can make. The next most important things on this, I think, are the, the bearings and the side, the side uh, supports, the guides. There should be a set up in here, and there is. If I see it better when it's open. So in many saws, there's a thrust bearing, which is a little wheel. There's a little wheel just behind the back of the blade, right in there. And it can be adjusted to come forward to meet the blade or go back, away from the blade. You want it to be up just about but not touching the back of the blade. How close is that? Well, I've been taught it's the thickness of a piece of paper over a two-hour bill. Just not quite touching. When I turn this by hand, 
I can see that that wheel is not being affected by the blade. The blade isn't touching it. It's fairly close, but not turning it at all. So that's one thing you want, just up, almost touching it. Otherwise, you cut a piece of wood in here, pushing the blade back, bowing the blade, not good. You need support in the back. There also will be two guide blocks for either wheels on some, or they're just blocks of wood, or blocks of some kind of bimetal material that support the blade on either side. Think of the blade coming down through, and here's your support on either side of the blade. Again, take this paper apart just enough so the blade can put a smidge either way, but not too far. They shouldn't be riding all the time because the heat built up. Not good for your bearings, not good for your blade. But just a paper width apart for that one. <coughs> Under the table, a bit harder to adjust, but the same things. Can you see it in there? It's looking up there easily. Can you see the wheel? There you go. Can you see the wheel in there? Yep. And there are also two little guide blocks. On fancy or bigger size, you might get three wheels instead of one wheel and two guide blocks, but they need to set you up the same way. When would you adjust these things? Well, you can look at them every time you use a saw, but put a new blade on it, adjust the tension, you have to look at that for sure, right? Something I haven't talked about is cutting a curve and cutting straight lines. We have two saws downstairs. I'm sure somebody's wondering why the big sign that says I want straight cuts only, the other doesn't say that. Well, can someone tell us the reason why one says straight cuts only? Bro? It has to take a blade. It's got a thicker blade, true. Anything else? It's for resawing. It's for resawing. And when you, want, when you want to resaw, you want a nice straight cut parallel to the face of the board. So why not? Is that one that says straight cuts only? For resawing, a thicker blade through? Yeah. If you use that one to cut curves a lot, like cutting out bowl blanks and stuff, what will that do to the, to the blade? It it's going to wear on one side more than the other side. When you cut a curve, especially lots of curves on a, on a blade, one side of that blade is a lot more wear and loses its sharp tooth than the other side of the blade. Because these, these teeth are offset, right? Every other one. So that's why I want one blade to only ever have straight cuts on it. It'll wear evenly on both sides, and therefore it's doing a better job making straight cuts for us. That's why it's that way downstairs. If you're at home, one band saw, you do what you do, right? Make it work for you. All right, uh, dust porch I talked about, okay. This, this saw does have, as most of them do in the table, a miter slot. Uh, this miter gauge is downstairs, but it's got one there, and they, it can be useful to put a piece against and the holding thing to push through. Useful. Doug, you're going to use the circle with a dowel on that thing too. A dowel over here? No, you're this? On the, on the you're right, it might be better than holding a freehand. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Better than nothing. Um, the fence. Our bandsaw is downstairs. Both have fences. This one did not come with a fence. This is the fence I made for my bandsaw at home. Uh, it didn't have any bars across. I put maple bolted onto the front and back of the table, and this then fits onto the maple. Having a fence is helpful for resign, or just for guiding, just for if you want to cut off a piece that's you know, a certain distance away from the blade, you can use, use it for that too. Should you use a fence at the same time as a, as a cross cut, a miter gauge? Well, definitely on the table side, it's a big no-no, because you're asking for big trouble. On this side, it's not as, as dangerous, but it's still a no-no. You're still going to create friction between the end grain there and the blade, and you're holding it here. You're holding it two different counter positions, it's not a safe thing to do. You shouldn't be used here and there at the same time. Uh, if anybody were resawing without using a fence like this, just using a, either a, a dowel or a post put in on this side. Have you seen that done? If you look at some of these on YouTube, you'll see where they clamp, rather than a whole fence along, just a like a vertical dowel or part of, part of a clamp almost right there that the board then would go against when you're resawing. And the board would go against only that part of the post. Yep. It allows you to keep the same distance away from the blade, but if you have to pivot a little bit this way or that way, you can, because you haven't got a fence all the way along. So it's, I've never tried that, but I've seen it done on YouTube's. Mike? Our big saw downstairs has an attachment to the fence to do exactly that. Does it really? Is it a post type of thing? <coughs> it's a, it's a, a curve, a half round shape. Half round shape, I didn't know that. Good to know. Good to know. Okay, then everything. Uh, Anybody got any things I've, I've forgotten here or missed that you want to point out? I'm sure I've forgotten something. Splitting around. There's a little butterfly nut at the front of the uh, oh, yes. slot. Yes, good. There's a little butterfly nut right here. Uh, my saw hasn't got this piece. I bought it a long time ago. But that's just to, to prevent the blade from going in or out without you wanting it to. This piece comes right out. When you put a new blade on, this old blade, if it didn't break, you have to take out through this front of the saw and then put the new one in the same way. It's just as a little safety mechanism there. 
Um, Margo mentioned cutting around stock sort of longitudinally. Get this out of the way. If I want to cut this long round log longitudinally through, the, through its length, if I'm doing it right through the middle of the log, I'll put it at the back so you can see. Through the middle of the log, I'm pretty safe because the force is right through the middle of the log where the log is supporting it. If I was off center, like, like that, trying to cut a slice off the log, I've got a problem again, because the force is going to want this log, the force is on this side of the log, it's going to want to turn the log that way, like you're going to go to zoom and spin and break the blade again. It's not a fun experience. If I had to do that, I'd either use a D block or put a clamp on this or two clamps on this, is leverage out uh, here so I can hold it securely. And glue the bottom to a flat piece of wood and cut straight through that way. Glue this whole thing onto a flat piece of wood so it can't spin, is the idea? Yeah. And then cut and then push it through. Okay, another good idea. Yeah, yeah. On, the, uh, on the larger bands so it doesn't have a little butterfly nut for when you're changing blades in, mm -hmm. as a steel pin. And it has two purposes. It's for changing the blade out but it's also for making sure that the alignment from either side of the bed is about it. Oh, is that what you meant? Yeah, goes in. Yeah, so yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, our, our saw downstairs, and this is my saw at home, have a little throat guard piece that, mm -hmm. on this side, doesn't have one, but it would fit in right where the blade goes through the table, right there. And it just, there's a whole hole there. Usually that's there so you can easily see and adjust the, um, the bearings and the, and the guide blocks that are under the table right there. This pops out, we can replace those. And it should be, you know, if it gets too, too big a hole from you making mistakes, then you got to put a new one in. <laughs> they, don't, they don't cost much, so they're pretty easy to do. Make wooden, make wooden ones as well, yes, sure, sure, they're cheaper. Anything else I forgot? Yes, the back. Mike, when you, when you set that blade up there, I think the most important thing is to make sure that um, when the blade pushes back into that bearing, yep. that the teeth don't go in into the guide box because uh, the illusion set that blade. Good point. Yes, the guide box, but I didn't mention that, you're right. The guide box support the blade on the sides, but you want the teeth of the blade, which are out at the front right now, facing you guys. The teeth of the blade shouldn't touch the guide blocks ever. Only the, the body, the flat body of the blade shouldn't touch the guide blocks. Even when the blades push back, as you said, against the thrust bearing, you want those teeth to stay just in front. So that the, the forward and back position is also adjustable, especially on, on better, better saws that have more finely adjustable and easy adjustable equipment that way. Which kind of speaks to Rob's earlier question about where does the blade go on the saw? Mm -hmm. right, it goes up on. It, it goes in the middle. <coughs> yeah, it goes in the middle. It's, it's got to fit your wheel and you got to fit your bearings that are here and down below, and you have to all line up nicely together. If they don't, you have to move something. Yeah. Yep. Your, your guides on a lot of saws when you get them, um, they're usually metal. That's why you want your teeth proud of them. Yeah. But um, you can swap them out. You can put nylon or whatever or wood. But I put phenolic blocks in mine because it doesn't uh, graphite in it. Yeah. So first of all, it won't build your blade, and then it's also lubricating your blade as it's getting spinning. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And then the other the other rule I use my band saw that applies the most equipment. If it doesn't sound right, something's wrong. If you're pushing the wood too hard or, or pushing it sideways, it's going to sound different. And that's a warning there's something not you're doing something wrong. The machine set up properly. Um, so just you know, use it use it gently. Same as a sander. Don't force it. Use it gently. It'll do its job. Rob. Um, What's the best way to ensure the blade is incorrectly when you're changing the blade? Good, good, good question. So, I heard a story once about some wise person in our shop. It could have been me. I, I, I heard the story, it was, I don't know who one of those older guys at the back mentioned it. And I thought, he's got to be joking. That just, that's, that's impossible. Have you ever seen a table saw with the, with the blade put on backwards? Yeah. Is it possible to do? Yeah. It's pretty easy to do that, right? And there's a reason you could do it for some, I've seen a guy do it on purpose for a different reason. He's cutting foam. It worked out great for him. But anyways, this is a bandsaw blade, which if I asked you to put this onto a bandsaw downstairs, or this bandsaw is the right size right now, it would be going on exactly backwards. It, it, it's inside out, basically. The way you undo the blade, you could undo it backwards, because after all, the teeth on this bandsaw, which way are they cutting? On the way up or on the way down? On the way down. So you want teeth facing down. You probably can't see these teeth right now. But these teeth, on this blade, it was made backwards, I guess. They're pointing up. Can you, can you see them? You probably can't see them. Let's verify that. Are those teeth pointing up, Calvin? Calvin doesn't know. So this blade, if I take this blade and turn it inside out, 
like that. Now, I put that, those teeth on the bandsaw, are they pointing down? They're pointing down. So this is the, the way you buy the blade, you first un, unravel it, it could be totally backwards. And it wouldn't, wouldn't cut very well that way. I'll try what Rob asked me at the beginning of the night, and so a few guys here did it beautifully, folding the blade up. So, the hands at about 10 and 2 or 11 and 1. Palms up. If it doesn't work, we'll give you a second chance. Should I go over here and do it? Where's it? I'm going to stay right here. Foot in the middle of the bottom. This is to get it coiled into three coils so you can then tape it and hang it up in your shop somewhere and be a lot smaller. Don't want the wire to get caught. So I'm going to do this, turn my hands in and down to the floor. It's going to be, so again, I turn my, my palms are up to start with. I'm going to turn them into the middle and down to the floor. And you see that part goes up, close to my knee here, ends up going down to the floor. And then you've got your three loops. You can adjust the size of them. Kind of the same time, I find you two together, and you, you see it happening. You can look at it on YouTube, there's guys here that do it with their eyes closed. I did it successfully twice, that's all I'm going to try. <laughs> yes, one last question. Rick? Uh, I've been very informative, and I really like the magic show at the end. Yeah, <laughs> Unfolding it can be very dangerous with a new blade. It's a very old blade of Arkham Holmes. It's very, very dull. You, you couldn't buy yourself if you tried. Unfolding, I've seen guys on YouTube say, so what you should do is take the blade out of the, out of the package, just throw it on the floor, it'll unfold itself. Okay. But if you've got anything in the floor other than a brush the old shop, you can do that. You, you can hold on to it and let it unfold itself, and it'll work. But if it's a brand new sharp blade, it is a bit risky. You can get a nice bad scratch if you're not careful. Um, Second and last question. Okay. One thing I wanted to say, because I learned it a very hard way, was uh, the the stroke uh, of your guide there? Mm -hmm. um, unlike the large saw downstairs, which has a knob for adjusting the height of it. Yes. Mine, you adjust it, and it, it's free flow, falling, right? Yeah. So being in a rush from time to time, didn't always get my other hand in there when I undid it, even though it was close to the table. Yeah. It doesn't take much to break white metal. Oh. And, yeah. Uh, it took five days to get to order a new part in. So just I saw, and when I was in the middle of doing a whole bunch of things. Just let that card drop down. Take yeah, the back. taking the time to do that tiny little thing like that, saving right. time and money. You're right. So my last comment, if you, you want you know, personal instructions, ask somebody, people will be happy to show you, for sure. Thanks, guys. Fair.